Once again, everybody, welcome to this, the second round table in our series on regional security architecture of the Asia Pacific. We're here today with Dr. Mira Rapp Hooper, who is a Stephen A. Schwartzman Senior Fellow for Asia Studies at the Council on Foreign Relations. She's also a Senior Fellow at the Paul Tsai China Center at Yale Law School. Um, at CFR, Dr. Hooper's work explores national security and strategy issues in Asia, including great power competition alliances and other subjects. Um, and even more impressively, uh, Dr. Mira Rapp Hooper is the author of a forthcoming book called Shields of the Republic, The Triumph and Peril of American Alliances. And uh, this is the, the book that we'll be focusing on today to talk a little bit about how the alliances have been viewed over time, how they're currently being viewed, um, particularly in the U.S. domestic political conversation, and uh, to talk about some of the benefits and, and costs and uh, challenges and opportunities of alliances in the modern era. Um, in addition to this book, which is coming out on June 9th, uh, Dr. Rapp Hooper is also co-authoring a book this year with uh, Rebecca Listener, and that will be forthcoming from Yale University Press. It is called An Open World, How America Can Win the Contest for the 20th Century International Order. So Dr. Rapp Hooper, thank you so much for being here with us. Rory, thanks so much for having me. I'd like to say a big thank you to the National Committee uh, for this kind invitation. It's really exciting to be a part of this very important series on architecture in Asia, and a big thanks in particular to you, Rory, for all of the thoughtful preparation you've put in. Well, I'm happy to do it. I think that um, having received an advanced copy of the book, I'm really excited to, to dive into some of this content. So um, let's get started with that right away. Why don't you tell us a little bit about why you decided to write on this subject at this time? Um, what is relevant today about American alliances and how can we better understand them? Well, Rory, I realized that America's alliances were in peril in 2016. On the campaign trail, the Republican nominee for president, Donald Trump, had repeatedly been attacking the American alliance system as expensive and useless. But the most worrisome part of these assaults, in my mind, was that they were not altogether unreasonable. The accomplishments of the alliance system were actually very hard to explain. And for American citizens who had known relative peace and prosperity for the last many decades, several dozen American defense commitments might have seemed like an unnecessary luxury. But I had studied alliances as a PhD student, and I knew that this explanatory difficulty, that is the difficulty in explaining what benefits America's alliances had brought to the United States and to its strategy, was a feature of alliances themselves. When alliances are working, the public does not see them at all. Their success is measured by the wars that never happen and the crises that never escalate. So the system has actually buried its own record. I knew that this record existed, however, and I felt that someone had to unearth it. So I got to work shortly after the 2016 election. And here's what I found. America's alliance system was remarkably effective throughout the Cold War, holding the balance of power in Europe and Asia through defense, deterrence, and allied assurance at a totally reasonable cost to the United States. But after the Cold War, without great power challengers, it went adrift. And more recently, rivals, namely Russia and China, have increasingly fixed this system in their crosshairs, developing military and coercive strategies that aim to split and unravel alliances without ever activating them at all. The United States, therefore, has a narrow window in which it can save this remarkable system, and it needs it more than ever, but it will have to remake it for the 21st century. Well, thanks so much for giving us that, um, that background. I think that one of the many impressive aspects of the book for me was that I fall into the category of people that you were just describing. Um, as someone who had a, you know, who studies Asia Pacific, the Asia Pacific region, had a general feeling that alliances were cost effective and goal effective, were effective at reaching our strategic goals, but didn't have some of the policy background to back up those statements with hard data and situations. So um, that's one of the reasons that I found the book so remarkably prescient and remarkably useful in my own work. Um, and I'm hoping that everyone listening in will have the opportunity to read it and benefit from those arguments as well. 
I'm wondering if we could get into some of that content now. Um, one thing that I'd be interested in hearing you speak about is a specific alliance success in East Asia. So again, like coming from a place where I'm like, well, alliances are good, they're cost effective, um, but I don't have a story necessarily to back that up. Could you take us through one story of an alliance success in East Asia and maybe also talk to us a little bit about the methodology that you use to, to make your argument in the book? Absolutely right. And I think you're pointing to something that's methodologically important here, right, which we'll get into over this course of this conversation. Because alliance successes are measured in wars that don't occur and crises that don't escalate, we need to look for cases of success in places where it easily might have been otherwise. During the Cold War, for example, the Soviet Union and China did not intend to wage wars everywhere. They weren't fully revisionist, aiming to topple every American ally. So we can't claim that every instance of peace was an alliance success. Rather, to my mind, the best way to look for alliance successes is to look at cases where we easily might have seen conflict, but we didn't. During the Cold War, I look at frozen conflicts, places like in Europe, the, the conflict in Germany, or in Asia, the frozen conflict between North Korea and South Korea, or the cross straits balance. And an example that I'd love to talk about today is what the US-Taiwan Mutual Defense Treaty was able to accomplish during the period that was in force. As many people on this uh, seminar may be aware, the US Republic of China Mutual Defense Treaty was in effect from 1955 to 1978 and was ultimately terminated as part of the decision to recognize mainland China and of course replaced by the Taiwan Relations Act, which is an act of Congress rather than a mutual defense treaty. Still a very important defense commitment, but qualitatively different than a mutual defense treaty. But what I wanna highlight here is the successes of that US-Taiwan pact while it was in force and the fact that those successes have actually translated on through the decades. The United States made its decision to commit to Taiwan through a mutual defense treaty at the end of the Korean War as part of a second wave of American defense commitments in Asia. That included the US defense commitment to South Korea, it included Taiwan, and it also included the Southeast Asia Treaty Organization, or CETA, which has since become defunct. And the idea was that US policymakers increasingly understood that after the Korean War, the Soviet Union and China had played a significant role in North Korea's invasion of the South and understood the Korean War as a failure of deterrence. So they began to think more and more about where deterrent commitments could be usefully applied in Asia to keep other wars from starting. Of course, the Chinese Civil War had already taken place at this time and the US 7th Fleet had been patrolling the Taiwan Straits for some time. So the United States had already sort of decided that it had a stake in seeing that mainland China did not retake Taiwan. But there was a very complicated problem to be solved as US policymakers considered whether they should give a defense treaty to Taiwan. And that was the fact that Chiang Kai-shek, the leader on the Taiwan, was a very complicated prospective ally. Anyone who knows his history will know that he was a major character. And at this time, he had specific aspirations to try to retake the mainland um, under the leadership of Taiwan. So from the United States perspective, the prospect of giving him an alliance was potentially dangerous. What if he used it as top cover to try to retake mainland China? And in addition to that, there was a set of outstanding territorial disputes between Taiwan and China. That is the disputes over Komoi and Matsu, the offshore islands that lay between Taiwan and China. And the United States did not want to make a commitment that would cover those islands only to have Chang advance his case um, at the cost of the United States, pulling it into conflict. What the US-Taiwan alliance turned out to be is a remarkable case of intelligent alliance design. That is a case in which the United States and its partner in Taiwan thought, thought thoughtfully about how to minimize the risks involved in this potential alliance while still allowing the alliance to be effective. So in Washington's negotiations with Chang, the parties agreed that the alliance would not apply to any offensive use of force. And they also designed the treaty so that it did not necessarily apply to Kamoi and Matsu. This le left the US and the ROC the opportunity to coordinate closely during the Taiwan Straits crises of 1954 and 1958, but did not obligate any specific action by Washington. 
And contrary to the fears of alliance critics who often argue that alliances increase the risk that the United States will be entrapped in conflict, the United States and Taiwan agreed ahead of time that they could take these actions to minimize that risk. The U.S. commitment nonetheless provided deterrence to Taiwan through two of the highest stakes crises during the Cold War. And by the time the Mutual Defense Treaty was abrogated in the late 1970s and the Taiwan Relations Act took its place, that settlement had already transformed cross-straits political dynamics. And it's hard to imagine at the time that a non-war outcome would have been possible without it. Yeah, I think that's a really salient story, um, particularly for, for this group of young leaders. Um, and it's one that does demonstrate not only some of the, um, the strengths of alliances in terms of how they can be managed through open conversations, but it also gets into something that I find particularly interesting, which is um, China's current response to alliances. So you mentioned at the in your intro that alliances after the Cold War have become a little adrift and they need to be reimagined. And um, I think that 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 ties very well into um, arguments that we often hear at the National Committee in our track two settings um, regarding China's view on alliances and their utility and management. So um, I'd like to move into kind of a lightning round of alliance tropes. So these are things that we hear uh, from, from our Chinese colleagues and participants and often from government officials as well in private settings um, and it explains their view on alliances and their argument for why alliances aren't relevant um, today. So, uh, and I'd also, I'd just like to add before we get into these tropes that um, the situation that you highlighted, the success of the, the US ROC Taiwan um, uh, alliance commitment in the 50s and 60s is often tied by our Chinese participants to Korean War and other issues. So in, in China's mind, the history of the American alliance formation in, um, in the 1940s, 50s, um, is really is not is not uh, country specific. It's really regional in focus. So with that in mind, um, let me have ask you uh, to respond to these these tropes. Trope one: Alliances are relics of the Cold War that made sense in a bipolar international system, but are destabilizing in a multipolar system. Well, there's no question that U.S. alliances have Cold War origins. The United States had almost no alliances until the early Cold War, with the exception of its first alliance with France that allowed it to become independent, and then, of course, in the Second World War. But U.S. alliances have generally been highly stabilizing, including in some ways that China itself has recognized. The first way is one that I mentioned in my opening remarks, and that is the fact that they've helped to keep the balance of power in Asia. Now, of course, sometimes that happened in ways that were contrary to Chinese interests, that is, prevented China from retaking Taiwan. But they've also restrained American allies in ways that further Chinese interests, I would argue. For example, preventing nuclear proliferation in Japan, South Korea, and Taiwan and encouraging the same countries to adopt very different and often much more restrained defense strategies and capabilities than they otherwise would have pursued. It's worth noting that for much of the Cold War and the decade after, Chinese strategists generally recognized American alliances as stabling in East Asia, and it's only much more recently that they've turned to arguments that they are destabilizing. Great, thank you. Let's move on to the next one. Alliances need a specific adversary to justify their existence and utility. Please forgive me, I'm oh. apparently on a flight path as well. <laughs> well, most good realists would say that that is true. That is, uh, would say that alliances need to be arrayed against something to justify their existence. But I think an important issue that I explore in the book is the fact that the United States saved its alliance system after the Cold War without a clear adversary in sight. That is, once the Soviet Union collapsed, neither Russia nor China was considered a particularly present foe in Europe or Asia, and NATO enlargement proceeded and alliances in Asia were saved, even though neither Moscow or Beijing was on the horizon as a potential rival. So while China may feel that the U.S. alliance system is increasingly directed against it right now, I would say that this causal arrow is reversed and that that has only become true as Beijing itself has become more assertive. Mm, 
No, that's a really good point. Um, the third Chinese trope. The U.S. uses, and, and this is related, I think, these are all variations on a, on a type of theme, of course. Um, the U.S. uses its alliance network to encircle China with the goal of keeping China down or constraining its rise. To answer this one, Rory, I think it's worth zeroing in on what exactly America's alliances are designed to do. America's alliances use defense and deterrence to protect the political independence and the sovereignty of the countries who hold them. And they do that through the application of international law. That is, all of America's Article 5 security commitments are based in the UN Charter, which permits collective self-defense to keep countries politically independent. By definition, this shouldn't constrain China's rise because China's rise should not be coming at the cost of the political ind independence of other states, so long as it is peaceful. So what America's alliance system has long been designed to do is consistent with a stronger China so long as that strength does not come at the expense of other countries. Yeah, I think that, um, you know, in addition to some um, disapproval of alliances from the Chinese side, um, as you mentioned in your opening, there's also been a lot of conversation in the American political environment about alliances and particularly about President Trump's view that uh, the cost benefit analysis of alliances has shifted um, and that you know alliances are not a necessary feature of American security policy anymore. So with that in mind, I'd like to do another lightning round of um, alliance tropes that have come um, from, from the Trump administration or from the president himself and see how you would respond to these. So first trope, alliances are too costly to justify their benefits. So well, interestingly, alliance do, alliances don't actually cost much of anything up front. Alliances are political commitments, that is, treaty commitments on paper that don't necessarily necessitate the deployment of any particular number of troops or the establishment of bases. What is costly is the associated force posture that the United States sometimes decides to deploy in its alliance partner countries overseas, that is the deployments of troops or the deployments of bases. But where the United States has decided to deploy troops or bases in allied countries, it does so as part of its own defense strategy. That is to say, Washington puts troops abroad because it has decided it's necessary to do so to keep itself safe, not because this is an altruistic deployment solely for the sake of an ally. And while the United States has historically spent a bit more than its allies on defense, that spending has been tolerable over the course of this alliance history. I think there's a reasonable case to be made now, however, for equalizing some of the burden between the United States and its allies a little bit more, as our allies are generally highly developed and thriving democracies, which they were not in the early days of the Cold War. But it's just as clear that doing so coercively is strictly counterproductive. Yeah, I think that um, a lot of people who are studying the Asia Pacific region in particular are watching the SMA uh, burden sharing renegotiations and the upcoming uh, military cost sharing negotiations with Japan with this with this content in mind um, and noticing, you know, the the backlash to a coercive press for um, for tripling or quadrupling uh, the alliance cost to the allies. So um, I think that's very relevant to today's conversation. Um, let's go into the second trope. And again, these are these also are variations on a theme. Alliances take, or I'm sorry, allies take advantage of the United States by free riding on the alliance system. So Rory, this is a great one because it's not only a common trope today um, coming from the current US administration, but it's a very common trope in international relations theory and literature. And there may be some very subtle ways in which US allies manage to free ride on the American alliance system, let's say spending a little bit less on defense than they might otherwise because they know that the United States spends more. But it's worth noting that for many decades, this was true because the United States wanted it this way. It preferred to spend more on defense because that gave it a bit more control over its allies' defense policies. But beyond these very subtle um, instances that we might point to, there are actually very few instances of a US ally reneging on a major commitment or leaving Washington holding the bag in a very costly way. 
in the book, the best example I can find of a US ally really defecting on a commitment is Charles de Gaulle's decision to leave the NATO military structure in 1966, forcing the entire alliance to relocate itself outside of France at substantial cost to the allies. This was definitely a costly form of free riding when it happened, but it's one of the only examples that we can point to. And even if we tabulate the cost for Charles de Gaulle's free riding decision, I am hard pressed to find anybody who would argue that his free riding outweighed the value that NATO displayed over the course of the entire Cold War. So if we compare the cost of allied free riding such as, it's, as it has occurred to the cost of a world without allies, there's really just no comparison to be had. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I think if I haven't mentioned this before, I do want to point out at this point that the, the content of the book that Mary has written is global in nature. It's not specific to the Asia Pacific, and it has a lot of really, really interesting content about our uh, US-European relations, our alliance with NATO, um, and other ways that alliances commitments have manifested around the world. So um, I'm, this event is focused on the Asia Pacific, but the book is really much more comprehensive than, than just one region. Um, let me turn to the third trope uh, from the kind of the Trump administration or the current political conversation on alliances. Uh, allies will trap the, I'm sorry, allies will entrap the U.S. into using its military to expand their own national interests at the expense of U.S. national security interests. This is another great one, Rory, because once again, it's actually a very common trope in academia and in the IR literature. But the trouble is there's very little evidence of this phenomenon either. The United States has never been pulled into war on behalf of an ally. And while it has joined allies in some crises, it's done so because it saw its own interest at stake in that crisis, rather than because the ally obligated it to join the crisis. This raises the question of why there is actually so little entrapment, despite the fact that the current political conversation and IR theory lead us to expect it. And here I'd bring us back to the Taiwan example that we touched on at the beginning of this conversation. That is the fact that smart alliance design has generally helped the United States to avoid entrapment in costly wars or crises that it does not wish to join. The United States and its partners have generally constructed these agreements to minimize the risk of entrapment. So the United States has had the freedom to stand by its allies in crises, but to commit no more or nor less than it wishes to, to defend the mutual interests at stake. And that's why we see so little entrapment in reality. Great, thank you. Um, I think we have time now to go into a very short discussion, um, bringing the content of your book into focus for this, this particular series and um, of, on regional security architecture in the Asia Pacific. So I, um, let's talk a little bit about the actual structure. Um, and in this case, I wanna think about how uh, the ROK in Japan have kind of similar security environments and largely agree on the major threats, uh, short-term and long-term that both are facing. But the low levels of trust between the two um, have often undermined their ability to work independently together. And, um, you know, one thing that is, uh, that is a part of the book and that I think would also be of interest to, to this particular audience is that our alliances in Europe and our alliances in the Asia Pacific look really different. Um, in Europe, we're talking about NATO. It's a web structure. It has, you know, its own kind of um, independent uh, organizing functions. Um, but in the Asia Pacific, it is much more hub and spoke. So while the U.S. Uh, has the al has an ally in Japan and has an ally in the ROK. The ROK and Japan are not necessarily committed to an allied defense of each other. Um, could you talk a little bit about whether or not a hub and spoke network is sufficient to meet our security goals in East Asia? Or is there a kind of a need to bolster this hub and spoke structure with a more webbed alliance management? Yeah, another great question, Rory. Um, from my perspective, and I think from the perspective of many American policymakers, it makes all the sense in the world that there should be more networking amongst American allies in Asia. One reason for this is exactly as you say, that the security landscapes of many of these countries are increasingly converging. Um, and over the course of the Cold War, that wasn't necessarily true. The United States formed alliances in Asia with respect to 
three different perspective adversaries, the Soviet Union, Communist China, and North Korea. And while US alliances in the Pacific are still primarily concerned with China and North Korea, the Soviet Union is no longer a primary threat to Asia, of course. And because of the changing nature of capabilities in both North Korea and China, many US allies in the region have concerns about both of these states, whereas they didn't before. Um, so again, from an American perspective and the ability to establish strong deterrence and defensive capabilities throughout the region, more networking between the states seems to make a lot of sense. However, as you've noted, Japan and South Korea are so sovereign states, independent states with a long history between them. Um, and that's clearly what has driven a wedge in just these last few years. But it hasn't helped that the United States has backed away from trilateral diplomacy at the moment that Seoul and Tokyo were experiencing these times of tensions. I would also note that in addition to the fact that these uh, histories between them tend to ebb and flow, this is a particular moment of domestic political misalignment between Tokyo and Seoul, with a relative le left-leaning government in Seoul and a relative right-leaning government in Tokyo that makes these history issues particularly pronounced. I do tend to think that they will pull back towards one another over time because of the shared threat environment that we've talked about, but it's also worth noting that part of the reason we have a hub and spoke system in Asia in the first place is because some of these inter-regional rivalries made it impossible in the early Cold War era to imagine a NATO-like structure in Asia. So it's necessary to just keep in mind the fact that some of this history is still very powerful and hanging over these alliances today. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that you've also touched upon, I think, um, some of the, the complications that are coming up in the modern world and that, you know, in some ways, um, defense and deterrence are not always just military anymore, but they really encompass a broader set of security interests, including economic security interests and um, non-traditional security threats. I mean, we're all living through a global pandemic, so I don't think I need to wax on about that. Um, but with those things in mind, could you, could you walk us through the major conclusions and recommendations from the book? And then right after that, we're going to go to participant questions. So if you guys are ready to raise your hand, chat your question, um, get in line, please feel free to do that at this point. Um, but for now, uh, let's start with the major conclusions and recommendations from the book. Absolutely. So I, I make the following case um, when it comes to where America's alliance system should go from here. Particularly in Asia and with con China's continued rise, the United States simply cannot study the balance of power in the region without close allies. If it pursues unilateralism, the great power math simply does not work in the United States' favor. China will have local quantitative military superiority inside of Asia in just a few years, although it will not surpass the United States in terms of its defense spending or the global nature of its military. But its economy will pass that of the United States in just a short while. And while Beijing presents a real military challenge to the United States and its allies, primarily through its anti-access area denial strategy and capabilities that aims to undermine security guarantees by demonstrating that the United States is not a credible defender, the more difficult problem may actually lie below the military threshold, as you've already alluded to, Rory. That is the fact that China has for years been pursuing an opportunistic strategy, advancing its aims below the military threshold in ways that don't trigger U.S. alliance commitments at all. Here we can point to issues like China's marita maritime assertiveness in the East China Sea or South China Sea, its operations in cyberspace, and increasingly its information campaigns and political interference, all forms of coercion that China prefers to the use of military force because they are cheaper and less risky than the alternatives. So if the United States wants to keep this alliance network from unraveling, and to make it an effective tool of studying the balance of power in Asia as China rises, defense and deterrence need to be brought to some of these new areas. And before I explain what exactly that means, I'll be clear about what it doesn't mean. I'm not arguing that the scope of America's alliance should, should, should be broadened to include everything. Deterrence doesn't work if you attempt to apply it everywhere. But there are some areas in which China's non-military activities have political effects that may come close to those of military attacks. 
let's say, major assaults on political independence that might credibly warrant alliance responses. Here I'm thinking about things like cyber attacks on critical infrastructure or political interference in domestic processes, where the United States Article 5 guarantees could be extended to include these types of infractions. Short of extending America's alliances to these new and really salient domains, alliances should increasingly be used as coordination mechanisms for a far broader array of challenges than just in the military domain. For example, evaluating the national security risks of new technology in 5G telecommunications, for example, or responding to China's use of infrastructure investment. And this renovation is not just for the sake of bringing deterrence to new areas, but for balancing burden sharing amongst alliances themselves. Many American allies in Asia face domestic political pressures that prevent them from spending more on defense, but they could spend more in their foreign affairs budgets, on homeland security, or on intelligence much more easily. Moreover, a renovation agenda like this plays to allied strengths. Our allies in Asia are already leaders in the areas of intelligence, public diplomacy, and technology, and many of them are already taking the lead in responding to China's regional coercion on their own. Additionally, I think an agenda like this, which promotes broader alliance cooperation, presents the opportunity of cooperation between Europe and Asia on issues like cybersecurity, political interference, or 5G and other technology issues. So put simply, defense and deterrence now are much broader missions than they were in the early Cold War period, and they will remain so as China continues to rise. We'll need to meet them where we are if we are to keep the system when we need it the most. Thank you so much. That's really, really excellent argument for what we need to do next with our alliance structure. And um, it, it dovetails nicely on some trends that we've observed at the National Committee um, between, you know, especially a trends about Europe and Asian allies working together or Europe and Asian partners working together. And I know like in the realm of cybersecurity, um, the National Committee has seen some kind of information sharing between countries that are targeted by uh, cyber coercion in Asia and those targeted by cyber coercion in Europe. So I think there is a really strong basis on which to build and, um, and it's, you know, it feels so much lighter to remember that this type of alliance update does play to the strength of our allies in these countries. So um, with that, I'd like to turn to participant questions. Um, again, just to give you, run through the options one more time. If you would like to chat your question, you are welcome to do so. I will ask it for you. If you'd like to ask your question and turn off your video, I, that is also a perfectly acceptable way to participate here. And if you feel that you would prefer to have your images edited out later, that is also fine. So with those three options in mind, um, the first three people who have raised their hand, which I will call on in this order, are Darcy Draught, Dong Ho Chung, and Adina Peckler. So let's start with Darcy. Darcy, um, please ask your question. Hi. Um, first, Mira, it's really nice to see you. It's been a while. Um, I have uh, a question that's both analytical and has some prescriptive questions. And then I'm going to sneak in another one based on your last answer, right, um, right to the last question that Rory had. So I kind of want to go back to this issue of alliances being kind of a two-level game situation. You, you, you opened talking about how alliances are under pressure, given the current domestic politics in the United States. And so um, I was interested in how you mentioned China and Russia are doing the series of coercive uh, and military strategies without actually threatening alliances themselves. So I wonder is how does that affect not only the strategic thinking of the United States, you know, strategic community, but also domestic public opinion. Are those actions that are happening so far away across the globe, how are those um, affecting public opinion, domestic politics? Um, and then relatedly, how does that affect how we can go about the kind of intelligence alliance design going forward? And so one of the things that I, I picked up in your last remarks was that alliances could serve as coordination mechanisms for new threats that are arising. Um, and then just to kind of throw another wrench into this, the threats that you mentioned are inherently transnational. They're not necessarily about the alliances in particular or about a, a given state security. So I wonder why are alliances the institution that needs to be used in order to counter those, to, to coordinate against those particular threats? That's a really complicated question, but thanks in advance. <laughs> Great, Rory, do you want me to take them one at a time? <laughs> 
Fabulous. Darcy, great to see you. Um, and thank you for a characteristically thoughtful question. Um, so I'll start first with this question on alliances as sort of two level games and how the Chinese and Russia, Russian pressure on alliances may interact with public opinion. Um, so when I talk about China and Russia both having sort of dual strategies for splitting American alliances, um, I mean that at both the sort of military and coercive levels. Um, at the military level, what I mean is that each Russia and China have developed a military strategy that aims to demonstrate without using force that the US security commitment is not credible. Um, now, as I already walked through um, in China, this means the A2AD strategies and capabilities that target Taiwan, Japan, um, potentially other US allies in Asia, um, because they raise the risk to the United States of coming to the aid of that ally, making it increasingly unlikely that the United States will do so. A similar set of dilemmas, although different, I should note, is posed by the Russians with respect to the Baltics. As the United States expanded NATO right up to Russia's doorstep, it has incre increasingly become incredible for the United States to defend the Baltics because, frankly, the Russians can get there and potentially attempt a fait accompli much quicker than NATO can defend them. So that's the sort of high-level military problem in both cases that aims to show both sets of allies that the United States may not be coming. Um, but the lower level coercive problem is, as you clearly picked up on, um, the fact that we're talking about sort of gray zone competition um, with both Russia and China, again, in very different ways, um, but that makes incursions that advance Moscow and Beijing's ways, with, with, Moscow and Beijing's aims, excuse me, without ever tripping the alliances at all. So we could point to Russia's domestic interference in the 2016 elections in the United States or in Europe, but we could also point to China's activities in the South China Sea or in cyberspace. When it comes to how these interact with American public opinion, I think the public is much more attuned to concerns at the military level than they are to these gray zone concerns, which is to say that public opinion polling in the United States displays a willingness to actually uphold American security commitments to allies in Europe and in Asia if any of them were to be the victim of a kinetic attack. Americans are generally willing to defend the Baltics, and they're generally willing to defend South Korea um, or Japan. But what they're not willing to do is make some serious investment of American capabilities on an issue that seems to have limited American stakes. It's a lot harder to get them excited about rocks and islands in the South China Sea. Um, so this is part of the reason that we have a major credibility problem in these alliances, which is that if the United States public does not see a reason to intervene in these conflicts, can the United States really extend its Article 5 commitments to apply to them? I think this creates the dynamic, which means that regional states increasingly have to be on the front lines of these types of coercive activities. The United States can absolutely support its alliances in doing so in careful and constructive ways. But if the Philippines isn't you know, willing to stand by its own uh, territorial claims in the South China Sea, the United States simply is not going to be able to do it on its own um, because the stakes as well as American public opinion does not support that. Um, to your second question about um, some of these activities and areas being transnational, I would note that some are and some aren't which is to say um, that some of the activities I'm talking about potentially deterring, you know, uh, coercion in the maritime space might not necessarily be, con be considered transnational because um, it applies to, um, I you know, islands that are under the administration of Japan or even um, cyber attacks uh, could certainly have major political effects within a country. Um, but some of these activities are transnational. Um, and I think part of the reason why alliances are sort of an interesting but still very relevant tool is because where the transnational aspects of these problems incur on a country's political independence, international law already says that they should apply. Um, it's a lot harder if you talk about, let's say, using alliances as coordination mechanisms to respond to something like a global pandemic. Because while I think we would all agree that it's a no-brainer that the United States should be working a lot more closely with its allies in Asia than is doing so right now, these transnational issues haven't traditionally been at the heart of the American alliance structure. So figuring out how we're going to use the standing channels that do exist by way of intelligence cooperation and technology sharing to apply to these transnational domains is part of the charge for the system in the 21st century.
Great, thank you so much for that. And apologies, I got kicked off of Zoom for a moment. I'm back to moderate again. So uh, the next on our list was Dong Ho Chung. Um, Dong Ho, would you like to unmute yourself and ask your question, please? Hey, how are you? Um, my name is Dong Ho, and it is my honor to take part in this session with Dr. Um, Rap Hooper. So at the beginning of this session, um, you said the U.S. alliance system has been in peril since 2016 when President Trump has been elected and undertaken some kind of uh, disengagement policies uh, regarding the alliance system. So in this sense, um, it is important to show American public the benefit of the U.S. alliance system. But I'm a bit worrying about the uh, future of alliance, not due to the issues from the U.S., but due to the issues from the allies in Asia or in Europe as well. Because I have seen the allies, um, especially from South Korea and Philippines, trying to be more autonomous or independent from the U.S. influence as they become relatively more prosperous and more powerful today. And I think um, the rise of their neighbor, like you know China, also played a critical role for their autonomous drives against the U.S. influence. So what I'd like to hear from you is that, um, do you think the client allies autonomous moves play some role in shaping the Trump administration's ongoing US alliance policy in Asia? And another question is, given that the US also has an interest of holding some sort of control on the allied security policies, what is the good way of compromising the um, conflicting interests among the allies countries? That is a wonderful question, and thank you so much. It was beautifully articulated. Um, I should be clear, actually, that the argument that I'm making in the book is not that the peril of the American alliance system is exclusively attributable to Donald Trump. I actually think that this peril began uh, long before Trump was elected, but that he's exacerbated structural forces that are already underway. And part of the reason I raise Russia and China and their use of both military and coercive strategies is because I think that those strategies and the changes in the international system that have brought them about are really at the heart of what has put America's alliance system in peril. I think this danger um, was apparent beginning in the early 2000s and it's only grown since then, but that the, the US president has catalyzed some of these forces that were already underway. So I very much agree with you that the shifting security situation is much broader than simply the fact of who is the chief executive in the United States. Um, that said, you pose a great question about the nature of allied autonomy and moves towards autonomy and particularly inside of Asia. And something that I would note that is true now and that has always been true is that when American allies do not feel assured, that is if they are not convinced of the US security commitment or they are not convinced that the US security commitment is going to be what they need it to be, they try to exert autonomy. That's actually a very natural choice for an ally to make. Um, allies, of course, are sovereign states and they can never know with perfect information that the United States is going to be there for them in the ways that it promises it will. So some of the dynamics that we've seen playing out in Asia are actually dynamics that were familiar to us from Europe during the Cold War. There were any number of US allies in Europe who needed constant reassurance that the US security guarantee would hold good. And there were a few cases in which the US allies simply could not be assured. I held up the example earlier in the talk of Charles de Gaulle leaving the NATO military structure because he was unconvinced that the United States would use nuclear weapons on his behalf. But part of the problem with the US leadership becoming more and more coercive just in the last three years is that these move towards autonomy have been accelerated. And when the United States itself uses coercion to try to get its allies to spend more, it encourages them to be autonomous in ways that won't necessarily complement the United States. That is, if you force your allies to try to quadruple their defense spending or to do more on their own, and they don't believe that you're going to be there for them when you need them, they will adopt strategies and capabilities that are geared towards indigenous defense. So part of the problem that we're seeing here now is this combination of structural forces that have been shifting in the international system, empowering rivals, and then a leadership change in the United States, which has brought coercion into the alliance dynamic. 
that is very much creating incentives, particularly inside of Asia, for allies to think more seriously about how to go their own way. And what I'm calling for in the book is for us to pull back from the brink in a moment where the United States and its allies still have the opportunity to recalibrate and restore themselves to a common strategic view that would allow them to take much more by way of common defensive and deterrent action together. But I think there's no question that if we fail to do so, we should expect allies in Asia to be more and more autonomous because they will be less and less convinced of the US credibility. Thank you. Um, I'm just going to quickly run through the list of people who are next in line to ask a question before we turn to the next question. So I have on the list Adina Packler, Daniel Wirtz, Andrew Yale, Peter Devine in that order. Adina, we'll turn to you next. Hi, well, um, it's nice to meet you, Dr. Rapp Hooper, and thank you so much for this insightful talk today. Um, I have two questions and they sort of build off each other. Um, the first one being with regards to um, the 2016 election and public perception since regarding uh, alliances and burden sharing, you talked about how the public needs to understand how this alliance system works. There needs to be a change in public perception regarding it. I was wondering in terms of how you see that happening in this country right now going forward, um, you know, where are we actively dealing with, you know, a fatigued public um, on top of that? And then um, my second question is with regards to remaking the alliance for the alliances for the 20th century, what you, you brought up at the beginning in terms of credibility. Um, with regards to not only sort of broadening the scope of issue areas to work on, but also, you know, is this going to put the United States possibly in a position where we have to approach conversations that we're slightly uncomfortable with and that allows us to progress forward, such as joining into international legal regimes, uh, such as UNCLOS or something like that with regards to maritime disputes, uh, or is it working more cooperatively again with a regional organization rather than just simply bilaterally? Yeah, thank you. Wonderful question. Thank you so much. Um, so I'll actually link the two parts of your question. The, the first part of your question about was about the best way to explain the alliance system to the public. Um, and the second part was sort of about the challenges we're going to confront as we try to remake the alliance system. And I think they actually are very closely coupled. Um, the first point I would make about the need to explain the alliance system to the public is that actually there is a level to which the American public intuitively understands some aspects of the alliance system. Public opinion polling in the United States is actually very supportive of alliances. Um, as I already mentioned in my ex exchange with Darcy, the US public is willing to join conflicts on behalf of allies if they are attacked. But much more broadly than that, they maintain support for the idea that America having allies is a good thing and doing business on the world stage with and through allies is a good thing. And they intuitively understand that is because it makes our goals less costly to achieve. So that's an important sort of base set of assumptions that the public actually very much does grasp. Although I think a lot of the intricacies of alliances and the record itself are much harder to explain. But to my mind, the way I would like to see the public narrative reshaped around alliances is to shift frames from a framework that's often very nostalgic when policymakers talk about them, talking about alliances as sort of a product of history, and an exemplar of shared values, something that we've you know, had since World War II, and make it very clear that this form of internationalism is useful to the United States for the next 70 years because it has helped to keep us prosperous and safe, and it can do so again. That is that alliances were never kicking around because they were purely altruistic or because they were purely um, a sort of matter of uh, geopolitical patriarchy, but rather because they were good for the United States too, and they still are. And that any world where we have an increasingly diverse set of challenges, where we have China rising, but also the transnational threats that Darcy held up, the United States simply cannot afford to secure its interest if it goes it alone. But that if it approaches its foreign policy in close cooperation with allies and remakes its system accordingly, it can secure the security and prosperity that it hopes to for the next 70 years. 
So again, rather than put too much emphasis on needing to draw out every little historical aspect of the successful record for the public, I'd like our alliance system to mirror a set of interests that simply shows them that their own instincts are right, that these things are useful and that they help us to achieve our goals more effectively and in a less costly way than we could possibly do otherwise. Thanks, Mira. This particular exchange brings to mind for me uh, a, a story and a further thought about um, how the American public sees alliances. And the story is I remember um, chatting with a former U.S. ambassador to China who held other positions in government and him recalling that in the State Department they would keep a map behind them um, where and every time the president would go out and say we have no greater ally and partner than X country they would mark it on the map and it turned out that every single ally and partner we have was the greatest um, but I, I say that story by way of illustrating a second point which I think your book makes abundantly clear which is that in the American public conversation, we often, um, we often don't specify where our partnerships are backed up by defense treaties and where they're more informal. So um, it is often the case that America thinks that we are allied with particular countries because we have a lot of shared interests with those countries. We have historical relationships with them, but in fact, we really don't have those treaty commitments. And that does color, I think, the, the view of American scope of alliances and their utilities. Um, so let us turn next to Daniel Wirtz. Dan? Uh, thanks, Dr. App Hooper, for a really great presentation. I look forward to reading the book. Uh, my question, I think, builds a bit off of uh, your discussion with uh, Dunko Chung. Um, given the ongoing political polarization in the U.S., um, given the kind of whiplash on major U.S. foreign policy issues from JCPOA uh, to the uh, Paris Agreement on Climate Change, and um, given the increasing preference for American unilateralism and uh, more coercive measures, not only on uh, trying to get allies to pay up, but on things like the use of uh, secondary sanctions and unilateral sanctions policies. Uh, does the U.S. have the credibility to build the kind of robust new alliance institutions uh, that you talked about, even under a uh, new administration? And what has to be done to, um, to build that credibility uh, so the U.S. will be seen by its current allies and uh, potential allies as a more reliable country to partner with. Daniel, thank you so much. This is an absolutely fundamental question. Um, I'll be clear, as I probably already have been over the course of this conversation, I don't think this renovation agenda is possible in the current administration, nor do I think it would be taken up. Um, I think it has been, you know, made clear to us that the purposes of America alliances and the way they are viewed um, is just fundamentally different um, right now than what I am recommending here. Um, but I do think this is possible. It's a, it's a very ambitious agenda, no doubt, if the United States were to change leadership in a few months. And I don't just think it's possible. I think it's necessary. And I think it's the type of agenda that perhaps, a, I'm not saying anything on his behalf, uh, but that perhaps a President Biden might very well like to adapt, but also that American allies would have to give a long and serious think about and potentially themselves very much embrace. Um, I think we're living through a moment right now in this completely epical and historic pandemic that has demonstrated to us that the United States is absent without leave and has left a tragic power vacuum and its own inability to handle the domestic public health crisis, but that the potential great power competitor in China is also not up to the task. Um, China has spent several weeks sort of rushing to global center stage to try to establish itself as the global health leader when the United States was clearly stumbling, but has really overplayed its hand. And while there are a number of other countries that have handled this pandemic, both domestically and internationally, much more responsibly, they tend to be US allies and they tend to be middle powers who are not going to be able to lead the global effort alone. But what these dynamics show us is that if the United States were to change tax and were to elect leadership that was intent on restoring an American strategy that relied on international cooperation, to keep the country safe 
and the international system safe, America's allies and partners would have reason to welcome it back. I think they would always be skeptical about the fact that we have taken the turn that we have for the last four years and that that would be a very hard set of factors to overcome. But the way that this agenda would have to start would be for a new U.S. president to visit with each one of these allies. And rather than to roll out the agenda that I'm suggesting here unilaterally, to start by taking stock with each allied country about the challenges that they are facing, the way they see the damages that have been done to the alliance system, and the role that they hope alliances will play in our common agenda going forward. Um, you know, we know that our allies have been despondent about the U.S. withdrawal from agreements to the Paris Accord, Accord to the Iran nuclear deal. But if the United States was willing to return to multilateralism, as well as to propose an alliance renovation agenda like this one, I actually think it could fit the current moment so long as we try to seize this opportunity that we appear we could have before us in just a few months' time. Great, thank you for that. Uh, we're going to turn now to Andrew Yeo, who I know is joining us from the Philippines. Um, Andrew, are you available to unmute yourself? Yes, hi. Can you, uh, can you guys hear me? Okay, good. Um, yeah, greetings from Manila. Uh, we're in the middle of a typhoon right now, so <laughs> there's that, that to deal with. Um, congratulations on the book, Mira. I look forward to reading it. I just had a quick follow-up on Dan's question, and I'll ask my uh, my question about uh, U.S. strategy in the Indo-Pacific, but uh, I mean, I also like to believe that if we have a change of leadership, that that we can restore some of the damage that was done to allies. But I mean, I I remember reading this piece by Dan Dresner a couple of years ago, and he was saying how the damage is so deep that it might take years before allies uh, come back to really trust the United States. And it's not just Trump himself, but it's Congress, it's polarization, it's, it's what's happening domestically in the U.S. And so uh, I, I want to be hopeful. I think I'm on the same page with Mira, but then I, I always think about that, that piece that I read by Dan. So, so uh, I just wanted to throw that out there. And then my question is really about your take on U.S. strategy in the Indo-Pacific. You know, there's been much more attention to South Asia, you know, strengthening our partnership with India, uh, the Trump administration has talked about new partnerships in Southeast Asia as well. Uh, you know, we, we have these investments with these you know, tiny little Pacific islands. I'm wondering if the U.S. is, I mean, if, if you are concerned that the U.S. is spreading itself too thin. You know, on one hand, we have these traditional alliances and we've been talking about shoring them up. But then at the same time, we, you know, we're expanding by looking uh, looking to build these new partnerships that, you know, if you think about the Indo-Pacific, it's, it's such a wide swath of, of, of ocean uh, territory. Um, so I'm wondering, again, in terms of U.S. strategy in the Indo-Pacific, do you think that this is something that's sustainable if there is a new administration? I mean, what are some things you advise? I mean, I, we can talk about mini laterals and looking at different configurations that go beyond alliances, but I was just curious about your thoughts on this. Wonderful. Thank you so much for joining us, by the way, in the middle of the typhoon, in the middle of the pandemic, and in the middle of the night. You really overcome a lot to be part of this conversation today. Um, and I really appreciate the great question. Um, so I'll start with, with your first comment, um, which, which of course builds off on Daniel's last question. I share your deep-seated concern that America's domestic political polarization is the greatest threat to our foreign policy. Um, that we have you know, immense international challenges to overcome, but that the prospect of, in particular, lawmakers remaining so deeply politically riven has the potential to introduce or to sustain a volatility in American foreign policy that could last for years um, and far beyond the bounds of any one administration. So I'm deeply concerned about that too. Um, I'll note that alliances amongst the panoply of American foreign policy issues tend to be relatively less polarized between the political parties than some other issues. And um, that is to see you tend to see a lot of support for alliance related initiatives across both political parties, even in this environment, but that's not to minimize the concern for a second. To your question about new partnerships in the Indo-Pacific and more specifically if the United States is spreading itself too thin. I do have concerns that the United States is spread too thin right now in the Indo-Pacific, um, but my concern is that that is because the United States is not committing nearly what it should by way of diplomatic resources. 
Um, so to start off, I'll note um, something that Rory said it, uh, earlier in this conversation, which is that you know alliances are one incredibly significant set of commitments that the United States has in Asia. That its partnerships are a bit different than its alliances, and that in most cases we're not necessarily talking about massive amounts of force posture or um, the exact same types of considerations when it comes to defense coordination. But if I had to hold up one concern about my broader view of defense policy or, or rather strategy right now in the Indo Pacific, it's that it is emphasizing the defense elements too much and underemphasizing the diplomatic elements. I think one area in which we've seen the Trump administration stay rather consistent with past policy in the Obama administration is on the defense leg of the rebalance to Asia, where a lot of American activities have continued more or less unabated. Whether we're talking about freedom of navigation operations in the South China Sea, or expanding port calls to countries like Vietnam, the diplomat or the, the defense leg, excuse me, of the rebalance is more or less consistent. But what we've seen is a significant degradation of the diplomatic commitment. We've obviously seen the president himself pull back from um, several of the most important regional summits. We've seen far fewer visits to the region by secretaries of state um, during this last administration. And that lack of diplomatic lift behind the American presence in the region, I think really degrades what progress had been made in some of these new partnerships, particularly because a lot of countries in Southeast Asia or South Asia, India, Vietnam, for example, are not looking to become US treaty allies. They are looking to maintain more autonomy and perhaps strengthen their relationship with the United States, but not in such an abundantly clear way that it changes their relationship with China. It's not enough to simply solidify the defense relationship. What we've got to be doing is building that partnership diplomatically first and foremost. So to my mind, our spreading too thin that we are seeing right now is because of the loss of diplomatic resources being uh, uh, applied to the region. And that is something that could easily be restored. Yes, thanks for that. I think that is also a frequent theme in our track two discussions in the region is um, and goes back to the topic of assurances. Um, there are more than, you know, there's more than one way to assure an ally that you're going to be there. And of course, keeping diplomatic channels open and robust is an excellent way to communicate those assurance messages as well. Um, the next person on our list is Peter Devine. Peter? Uh, good afternoon, doctor, and uh, thank you for your time. Uh, you mentioned early in your talk, and it kind of progressed from there, um, that alliances tend to be measured in, in wars that don't occur. And I was wondering, um, it seems to me that at least in a, in a narrow view or in a short run view, that kind of plays to an isolationist argument, like, well, you we could just not participate, and that accomplishes the same goal. I don't agree with that, but um, my extension is, are there other benefits to alliances other than just avoiding a war? Um, and how can we maximize them? So what are kind of the most important steps in your mind uh, in the non-military arena, specifically financially and technologically? Thank you. Another great question. Um, so please, if you get a chance, take a look at the book because I try to flesh out the whole range of alliance benefits beyond wars that don't occur and crises that don't escalate. The most obvious set of benefits that the United States has enjoyed is the political support of its allies on all manner of its own foreign policy priorities since the beginning of the Cold War. Um, this is a difficult one to measure because it occurs everywhere from you know, US allies joining Washington in its own wars of choice to much more subtle things like political support at the UN Security Council or the UN General Assembly uh, supporting its resolution. I think we could point to you know, several dozen metrics for the fact that the United States has had collaboration on its own foreign policy goals that would have been much more costly for it to achieve without allies. But again, very difficult to quantify what exactly that counterfactual looks like because we can't measure the world in which alliances didn't exist. We can, however, point to a few other things that I've already alluded to. Um, in my talk today. That is the fact that we have good evidence for the fact that alliances have restrained the spread of nuclear weapons and that they have shaped 
um, both the United States and allies' defense policies in ways that I think are much more benign than they would have been otherwise. Uh, they've also induced cooperation between countries that were not apt to cooperate before. Uh, part of the European political settlement on the continent, continent after World War II um, was, you know, an act of European unity, but it was also facilitated through NATO. Um, so the, the, to the extent to which Europe is unified now, which is obviously a fractious and, and difficult um, set of questions to wade through, defense commitments have a lot to do with that. Um, but I'll come back to the first part of your question, which is that if by measuring wars that don't occur, are we actually uh, sort of giving some fuel to the fire of restrainers or isolationists who might prefer the United States not to join those wars at all? And I think the best example here is the Korean War, which is to say that we know that the United States has the ability to make fewer defense commitments, to not have allies, and to stand aside, sort of restraining itself to its shores and wait to join wars only when it has decided that those wars are in its interest. But we also have the experience to demonstrate that when it does that, it has to fight its way into those wars in a manner that is far more costly in blood and treasure than it possibly could have been to try to deter them or to meet them at the crisis level in the first place. So part of the reason that the Korean War became the sort of paradigmatic example of failed deterrence is because the United States considered making a commitment to Korea, didn't make it, and therefore did not have a stake in the game when North Korea invaded the South, but only through a massive commitment of troops, loss of lives, loss of treasure, um, and a multi-year you know, side-by-side -side war with the people of South Korea, who of course bore the brunt uh, of this horror, did the United States reestablish the political settlement that it would have preferred to see all the time. So that's part of the reason why I argue that we have to consider the counterfactual anytime we're making an alliance argument. That is to say, unless you think through what the world looks like without the alliance, you can't really make the case for the costs of losing it and the benefits that we continue to derive from having it in place. Thanks, Mira. Um, we have one question um, sent in over chat that I will raise. Uh, I will raise. Um, could you talk a little bit about the issue of whether or not U.S. alliances undermine international law and the international system? Um, for example, the U.N. would not give a resolution for Iraq in uh, 2003, but the U.S. was able to use its alliances to forge a coalition outside of the international system and law. Um, so, how you know, we talked a little bit about how alliances are are meant to be codified under international law, but maybe you could talk a little bit too about the effects of alliance use outside of the system. It's a good question. I'll, I'll start um, from the beginning by you know, noting the specifics of how American alliances interact with international law. When the United States created this alliance system in the early days of the Cold War, this was a completely unprecedented experiment. Great powers had, of course, you know, had alliances amongst themselves before, but when they had formed them in the past, they were generally always used to prepare to fight specific wars. So whether we're talking about um, the alliance system on the European continent after the Congress of Vienna or the pre-World War I alliance system in Europe, these tended to be alliances amongst relatively equal powers that were preparing to meet a shared rival on very specific terms. The major innovation of the American alliance system was that these alliances were conjured to remain in place indefinitely and to keep wars from starting at all. But one of the other innovations of the system is that they were specifically written with respect to international law. That is when the United States began to draw up its security guarantees beginning with NATO, it invoked the UN Charter and the rights under the UN Charter to use collective self-defense to protect the territorial sovereignty and integrity of any country. That is the right of any country to invoke the defense by an ally if it became the victim of an unprovoked attack that threatened its political independence or sovereignty. So written into every one of the US alliance treaties is that reference to the UN Charter, to collective self-defense, and to Article 2.4. And part of the reason this was so innovative is the United States was actually using this new system of PACs to try to legitimize international law and the United Nations Charter in its very earliest years. 
the UN Charter, of course, was just a couple of years old when the United States began to design this system. And it knew that if it placed too much emphasis on defensive alliances over and above international law, it would actually weaken the UN itself in its earliest days. So it actually decided to link them very purposefully to give the UN a little bit of a boost in its early days. Now, coming back to this question about whether, nonetheless, U.S. alliances can be used for extra legal purposes, I think there's no question um, that the U.S. invasion of Iraq was, at the time, extra legal. But there's also no question that its allies were not obligated to join Washington by virtue of the alliance themselves. America's alliances apply to the direct defense of the allies in question. They do not obligate those allies to join the United States in out-of-area conflicts. So whether we're talking about allies joining the United States in the Vietnam War, where it had nine allies, in Afghanistan, where I believe it had 34, and in Iraq, where it had 24, the United States has enjoyed that support by virtue of the voluntary decision-making of those countries, sometimes very difficult and sometimes against the preferences of their own publics, but not because the treaties themselves obligated those allies to act out of area. Great, I think that's a really important distinction, so I'm glad we were able to cover that. Um, we are nearing the end of our time for question and answer, so I implore anybody who hasn't gotten a question in already to please raise your hand at this time. We'll do the best we can to fit everyone in. Um, and now we're going to go turn back to Darcy for a second question. Darcy? Yeah, thanks for uh, allowing me. Um, so I want to thread the th uh, pick up the thread a little bit from your answer to both Dan and Andrew's question about the effects of this apparent uh, unilateralism that's running through America vis-a-vis -vis its alliances. And, and I wonder if you could speak to what evidence you have you see in terms of whether allies would, in fact, welcome back um, the United States in a way that was similar to its alliances prior to 2016 or wherever we want to date it, or in the future going with this new imagining of the alliances, whether it's not just in terms of rhetoric, but also, I mean, are there do you see like stable institutions that will allow for a return to this robust, the, the more robust alliance system, um, maybe capabilities that are speaking, specifically de being developed among our allies that would allow for, you know, further strengthening the alliances? I don't know. In my conversations with, I work on US-Korea alliance issues mainly and, and talking to my Korean interlocutors, you know, there's generally a very uh, there's a, a thirst for the United States to return, and yet there still is this strong lingering apprehension, the kind that Dan Dressner was talking about in his alliance about U.S. credibility. And so um, I wonder what kind of evidence you see um, about that potential return or, or new direction for strengthened alliances. Another wonderful question. Um, I think there's no question that unbelievable damage has been done um, to the United States credibility, and I don't think we can make any assumptions about how allies would welcome it back or on what terms. And of course, we could see different answers across different alliances or even within them. Um, I could imagine different NATO members having different tolerances for a new alliance agenda that the United States proposed after everything that they have gone through. Um, you know, I think, there, again, there's no question that public opinion of the United States, and in particular of US leadership, has also most precipitously declined in allied countries. So if you look at where you, public opinion of U.S. leadership has nosedived, countries like France, Germany, South Korea, Japan are the most disappointed in U.S. leadership, whereas countries that didn't have relationships that were as close with us before had less far to fall um, from 2017 onward. So that's sort of an interesting uh, pattern in the data. But when it comes to the question of the extent to which they would welcome us back, I can only speculate, but the best sort of area that I would point to is the fact that there has continued to be a lot of good work inside many of our alliances on the working level. That whether you're talking about the US-Japan alliance or the US-ROK alliance, where things have gotten a lot more difficult recently because of the special measures agreement negotiations, until now, they're actually at you know, much lower levels, the kind of DASD level, DAS level of the US government, um, was a tendency to keep things more or less on track. In particular, in areas where you had career experts or longtime expert political appointees in positions, and where allies knew who their counterpart was, 
who continue to see a shared interest in the alliance and shared stakes, there continue to be a fair amount of good work done. And I think that will be particularly important if the United States does change leadership in having kept in place the channels that were able to get work done the whole time. So for all that we've seen the president disappear from regional summits in Asia and secretaries of state make far too few visits, our deputy assistant secretaries have been doing the jobs that deputy assistant secretaries generally always have done. Um, many of our career civil servants on the National Security Council are working harder than ever. Um, and these are the people who, if we get a chance to return to our alliances, we will in part have to thank for keeping those channels alive and well with their counterparts on these vital issues. Thanks. I think that's also it's a, a really salient trend of um, kind of under understaffing as well in the State Department and Defense Department and the National Security Council on these issues it does really affect our ability to reassure allies. Um, and, you know, that might be a one way to address a counterfactual um, to look at the public opinion that has been lost in those countries and see how, you know, US choices have affected that. Um, I'm going to turn now to the last question from Blake Lockler. Blake? Yeah, thank you, Rory. Um, so my name is Blake Lockler out here in Utah. And a uh, quick question about, well, I don't know how quick it's going to be, but uh, regarding alliances and specifically our uh, military alliance uh, structure with NATO, um, how should the U.S. address concerns with partner, with, I should say, member states of those alliances whenever we have incursions um, and some cross-pollination of threats from China regarding uh, 5G communications or other uh, telecommunications um, uh, infrastructure being developed in some of those member states within alliances or whenever China is acting on uh, um, predatory finance, which could ultimately um, put China in a geopolitical position to have basing closer to those alliances or within those alliances. Great question. Um, so these are both areas, 5G um, and China's use of infrastructure spending, where I would like to see much more established and standing cooperation between allies in East Asia and allies in Europe. Um, that is to say, once upon a time, when we thought about America's alliance system, it was geographically segmented because the threats sort of came from distinct adversaries and they were primarily military. So we thought of them as occurring across specific borders. But when we're talking about issues of cooperation on new technology or we're talking about finance, we are increasingly talking about issues that bring both allies' sets of concerns together. Um, so step number one, for my mind, is create standing working groups between NATO and allies in East Asia that focus on both of the issues that you talked about here. Um, I think that when it comes to BRI in particular and the types of activities that US allies might like to cooperate uh, with each other on, American allies have already actually started to lead the way on this. And while we are starting to catch up, Japan in particular, and to a lesser extent Australia, has started to carve a strategy for kind of lightly participating in BRI while also presenting its own higher standards infrastructure alternatives um, that show us the playbook for what it might look like to do this multilaterally and with the cooperation of allies across regions. Um, so what I would like to see is not only uh, us to see, to have allies cooperating between Europe and Asia much more closely, but for us to multilateralize our own provision of alternatives to China's infrastructure spending so that all of these governments can use the, the public entities they have to try to direct more private capital to the areas where allied countries have decided they might reasonably try to put up alternatives to China's investment. I'll note as a side point that I think we're likely to see BRI take a very different shape after the pandemic because we are just now starting to see debt crises emerge all over um, this massive sweeping initiative. And I don't think it's gonna turn out to be sustainable for China over the long haul. So part of what I'd also like to see the allies cooperate on is figure out how to provide debt relief to some of these countries that are now mired in massive economic crises of their own and are not going to possibly be able to repay China. And finally, just back to the issue of 5G, no question that we also need standing working groups here too, as well as on the issue of cybersecurity. Um, I think that while the United States generally did not have a lot of success in its policy 
to, of trying to force allies to choose between the United States and China. Where it did have a little bit more success was in Asia, um, where in particular Tokyo and Canberra were relatively convinced of the case for not working with Huawei earlier on. Um, but it saw less success in Western Europe. So to my mind, something that might have made the US case a lot more airtight was if European allies had had the opportunity to hear from Tokyo and Canberra about what their concerns were, um, not just take the Trump administration's word for it when they felt like they were being forced to choose. We're now in a situation over the course of the pandemic where we're hearing that the United Kingdom and Germany might actually be rethinking their own decisions on Huawei. So as they do, and if they do, I hope we will encourage them to hear more from Tokyo and Canberra about how they came out where they did. Thank you. Thanks, Mira. And um, I think that uh, before I turn it back over to uh, our president and CEO, Ambassador Susan Elliott, for some closing remarks and uh, previewing our upcoming programs at the National Committee, I'd just like to ask as a final question, is there any point of emphasis that you'd like to leave this audience with at the end of the discussion? Thanks, Rory. And, and you know, before we, before we depart today, thanks so much to you all. These were really terrific questions and an energetic discussion. I enjoyed it so much. So this has been a lot of fun. The final point that I want to make, um, which may have come out over the course of the discussion, but I'll just try to drive it home here, is that this has been a remarkable experiment by the United States and its allies. This system, when it was formed, was ambitious. It was novel. And it was ultimately more effective than Cold War strategists ever could have anticipated. But it is without question on the ropes at a time when shifting power and the nature of our global challenges really mean that we need it more than ever. I really do believe we have a chance to save it, but if we don't act, it will crumble and we will all watch that process. And I do not think there is any substitute. So I'll leave us with that and my thanks. Thank you. That's a very powerful closing statement. And let me just add right before I turn it over to Ambassador Elliott that um, buying and reading this book will arm you with the data and knowledge that you need to advance that argument and to be a part of this conversation about saving American alliances. You know, this is a this will affect us all um, or many most of us in this room. You know, we are all American citizens. We all have um, uh, you know, I think uh, a love for this country and a desire to see it move forward with the strengths that it has. So um, I think that we can all, you know, use the content of this book to kind of help ourselves be better prepared to advance an argument that will ultimately um, translate into a better security environment globally for the United States and leading with United States strengths. And I'll just add a final point because I always like to make this um, to make this point when it's available is the book is incredibly well written. Um, this is not an academic slog. You are going to pick this book up and finish it in a night a night or two and it's going to make you as energetic as I think um, Mira's last statement made me uh, to go out and participate in this conversation. So please do buy the book if you can. And with that as the final note, I would like to turn it over to Ambassador Elliott um, to close us out. Ambassador Elliott. Well, thanks, um, Rory. And thank you, um, Dr. Rapuber, for an outstanding presentation. And I think one of the things, especially in the last questions that we had that really um, hit your points home to me is that, you know, what I think of having been a diplomat and um, been involved in foreign policy for many years is that what we've traditionally thought about about alliances is not the way we're going to think about them today and into the future. You know, for me, NATO was NATO and it was protection of the transatlantic alliance and our relationships with the Japanese and the Koreans had to do with China and North Korea. And as you have very um, skillfully pointed out, that's not going to be the way it is in the future. So alliances are not only important, but they're also extremely complex and we need to think very creatively in the future about how we're going to continue the alliances, not just in a military way, but you know, in a way that will uh, uh, help us all economically and to look at threats like what we're dealing with now. I mean, our president says we're in a war. We are dealing with a global threat that doesn't have anything to do with a military alliance. And yet, by using our alliances, we're able, I think, uh, 
to better combat anything that we see in the future. So thank you again very much. I'm very much, I haven't read your book, but I'm very much looking forward to reading it. And I also would like to thank the Korea Foundation because without their um, generous support, the National Committee on American Foreign Policy would not be able to host these, um, these dialogues. We will be having more in our series. And in addition to um, our programs for emerging leaders and all of you who are on today, we have a lot of other pro public programs which you can go to our website and look at. We have one on Monday at 1 p.m. where we're going to talk about the Middle East um, with an author, um, Kim Gattis, who's written a book called Black Wave. And it really looks at the relationships between Iran and Saudi Arabia and how they have developed over the years. We also have another um, very important program coming up on May 20th that we're um, co-hosting with the Japan Society and we're going to have former um, diplomats, not only from the US, but from Korea, China, uh, and um, Japan to look at, again, how do we deal with um, what I would call transnational threats in, in the future. So we have a lot of things coming up. And um, if your questions are any indication, we'd really love to have you be involved in and ask in more questions in not only our Emerging Leader Series, but in our other programs that are coming up. So anyway, thank you again, Myra, and thank you, Rory, for putting this together, another fantastic program. And um, even though I'm an older, waning emerging leader, I really enjoy hearing what all of you have to say, and it gives me hope for the future. So thanks again. Thanks all, and we'll see you next time. Thank you.